All right. Hello, I'm Casey Peluso, joined by Christine Haythorn of Parkinson Foundation, Western Pennsylvania. We're really excited about today's program. This is the first of a series, a Parkinson's Primer series. It's never too early nor too late. And today the session is the big picture. So Josefa Domingos and John Dean are going to dive into how we see Parkinson's today, what to expect, especially early on. They'll do a really nice job of connecting symptoms with day-to-day -day living, what makes symptoms worse and the treatment options so you can live your life more fully. And I'm delighted to introduce John and Josefa. Josefa Domingos is a physiotherapist that has been working with Parkinson's populations since 2004. She serves as the healthcare coordinator for the Portuguese Parkinson's Association among other international Parkinson's Association. And John Dean, speech and language pathologist has been working with the Parkinson's population since 2007. He currently serves as the chair of the Health Professionals Special Interest Group of the International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society, as well as on the Scientific Advisory Board of the Davis Finney Foundation. So these two wonderful professionals who happen to be married are going to really enlighten you today. So please take it away. Thank you both so much. Oh, and so we, we are the result of the work we did. We crossed and we met. And so Parkinson, right. you know. <laughs> I remember so clearly meeting you in 2011 <laughs> at a conference because we're nerds <laughs> and it was great and it worked out really well. <laughs> um, we're going to go ahead and jump into the slides a little bit. As, as Casey mentioned, go ahead and put stuff in the chat. And if we have a little time at the end, you we can do a little back and forth Q&A. We really want to make sure that we're responding to the questions that you're asking throughout. So uh, let me... Yeah. There I see. I'm going to do that. Beg your pardon, folks. Going to just come over here. When we are a team, one always has to be dominating well technology. <laughs> uh, yes, well, it's one I don't way, know if I've, I've just demonstrated that It's a criteria for the success <laughs> of working with, with the husband. <laughs> okay, so. Hi everyone, and um, we are really pleased to be here. Thank you for the introductions, and we are going to try to be as you know practical as possible in terms of the messages that we are passing. I would say this is the way we summarize what we're going to do today, which would be really uh, thinking about um, I would say actions and messages that are important for people to to know throughout. The, the process of the disease, right? So we're living with the Parkinson's disease. And so what would be information that can truly be useful in, I would say, uh, in, a, in a situation where people always want to know what's going to happen, right? And we all have access to this type of information at this moment. There's so much going on, but we want to truly transform this into something that would be from our experiences. Let me see, just go. There you go. Yeah, well, and it, it, all the work we've done over the years, um, not just clinic, but we do a lot of retreats, we do a lot of educational programming, we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one exercise classes, and um, that's really kind of who we are. That's kind of the work we like to do, and the, the answers you get today may may be a little off the beaten path, and we, we draw from our experiences, and that's why we like to talk about it. Yeah, so it's more than the, I would say the best moments where we learn more about how the, the disease impacts people with Parkinson is really outside of the clinic. So even though we might have experience where, you know, we inside uh, the surgery room with the, someone that's with Parkinson or in the clinic or in the programs that we do, it's really outside of those moments where the best knowledge has been, uh, I would say, gathered. And I do have the privilege of being with people for many years ongoing. So um, usually I, I wanted to share that this is the question that people most ask me when they're with me in the first in the beginning. And then um, I, I actually have the privilege to be with them after those five years and after those 10 years. So we would like to share with you maybe messages that really make sense for people to be able to answer this question in, I'd say, a more useful. I like the word useful because sometimes too much information could be harmful. And it's really about us learning how to transmit this type of information 
so that the journey can be less fearful. Yeah, it's not more information. It's the right information at the right time. I, I just want to expand really quick while we keep moving on here. Mm -hmm. In in Portugal, it's a little different setup, and Josefa will work with someone ongoing for years. I, I've seen people that she's worked with for eight, nine, 10, 11 years. And in the States, especially when we work with someone who's under Medicare, um, we have a certain amount of time we can work with them in a certain, uh, like in, an, in a year and then it resets each year. It's a different model. I love what they have over here. It's really, it's amazing and it's special and it gives her a different kind of perspective because she sees all the ups and downs. And a lot of times someone's on my caseload for a little while and then they have to come back off and they come back on later in the year. It's yeah. a different, it's a different way of doing things and it's a good way. So we have to really you know, feel that prepare, you know, to be with the person in different phases of the disease yeah. and so and to be useful in different ways it, so the reflection hopefully this this presentation will will bring that a little bit of that knowledge that we've been acquired and, and regardless of us or america uh, us or portugal that is the most common question i think we've all get it what's going to mm -hmm. what's it going to look like in five years or ten years mm. okay so when we talk about prodromal parkinson's this this prodromal phase sometimes you hear it being called that's the time before the formal diagnosis that's a 20 30 maybe even 40 years before symptoms occur and we don't know as much about it it's something we would like to know much more about because it would help us characterize the disease better maybe give us better tools but uh, you know you'll see certain things cropping up one is REM sleep behavior disorder specifically uh, is a higher risk factor for getting Parkinson's, but sleep issues in general are something people report before their diagnosis, and you may have noticed it as well. Uh, changes in uh, depression and anxiety, having that show up later on in a later adulthood, uh, that's often indicated with Parkinson's. It's a, uh, it's a red flag for it, we'll say, because if you have depression, often it would happen much earlier in your life and it would recur, but if it's showing up for the first time, that's something that, that we would see. And then the ones that you may be more familiar with are the ones that you hear more frequently are people talking about the loss of the sense of smell. That's the hyposmia. And then constipation. And even one episode of constipation can, can indicate a higher risk for Parkinson's over time. And then right before the diagnosis, again, sometimes this has to do with the interrupted, the fragmented sleep, but during the day, daytime sleepiness, that's sometimes something that shows up in this prodromal area. And again, if we could start to un unwrap that and identify that before the diagnosis, we could get to that diagnosis faster. And that helps us now because we know now that there are tools that we have, you know, mainly exercise. Yeah, so I, I think the key message here is like, so, you know, as the global community of Parkinson, the interest in this phase is to, for us to be able to really understand the underlying mechanisms that might be uh, causing the disease so that we can get quicker to a cure, right? So the relevance here is, is also uh, participating in research and, and also knowing that if there are things that we are already identifying that reduce the risk of developing Parkinson, like exercise, there's already uh, research showing that, then maybe we already have something to offer. So before, you know, diagnosing before or not, we didn't know what to do, or we didn't have anything to, to clearly offer. At this moment, we do. So this gains more and more popularity in terms of, of research and also for the long-term outcomes that we want to find the cure, right? Well, yeah, and this is an interesting thing because now we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, large population kind of machine learning approaches. So we're able to capture this earlier. And again, 10 years ago, we might not have had the data to say, what do you do with this? You know, we know something earlier, but it's not as valuable. But the, the research data that came out starting in 2015 has really changed the game for that. And everyone now has the memo that exercise is king. I mean, you really have to be doing that to, in order to modify the disease over time. Yeah. So I think the interest and most people will think, oh, there's nothing. Even today, I heard so, uh, someone that I was uh, doing a home call and he says, oh, there's nothing being done. And I said, no, there's difference between you not having access to the knowledge, not knowing what type of research is coming out. Then there's nothing being done because there is a lot of research going on. And that is um, it should be a reason for enthusiasm in terms of how many people are fighting uh, with you. Yeah. And I would say, obviously, uh, everyone here, you probably has the uh, related already the diagnosed. So if we think about what would be relevant for us to think about in early stages and early diagnose. And one of the things that we do know, people tend to um, go from doctor to doctor. There's an average of two to four years before people actually get a final uh, diagnose. 
So this means that there is some discomfort in trying to, um, you know, find the right uh, way to go right in the beginning, right? So what we thought about, okay, so I think the most important thing for people to, to be able to know what to expect from a neurologist. So if people are given this knowledge to understand why is the doctor doing this or this, why is he not ordering more exams? If we don't know what to expect, that means it can be a cause of anxiety. And I would say I've had one of the, the I would say, coolest experiences ever, which has been uh, being inside the doctor's office, just observing what uh, what would uh, happen in a normal clinical uh, situation for more than one year. I would always go on Wednesday, I'd spend the whole day with the doctor and I'll just, just next, next to him, just observing what people complained about and what the doctor actually asked. And I would say it's interesting what you can learn, how much people don't talk and communicate. So how the, the doctor will focus a lot on uh, the symptoms that he can control, which is normal. And remember how practice is changing a lot as well. So they might be doing more questions. And it's also interesting that the, the person with Parkinson many times doesn't know what exactly to ask, right? So this is interesting for, for us to think about, okay, so what should I expect? Expect that the diagnosis is based on uh, symptoms and signs. It's still based on the best clinical expertise of the, the neurologist that you have. And that's why it's important to, to go to someone that's specialized in Parkinson's disease. And so you will see that he is probably asking you to do movements like this or opening and closing your hand. And people sometimes find, oh, this is so simple. He just asked me to do this. But these are movements that will allow him to identify what they call the, the core symptom, which is bradykinesia, which is slow movement. So what he's looking for is slow movement. And he's also looking to see if there's a breakdown in movement, if you get quickly fatigued as well. And so these are important issues. This is has to be there in order for you to have the diagnosis of Parkinson. Then you have other things that usually you would you would um, instantly think about Parkinson, the rigidity, which is important for you to also understand how is he going to monitor this throughout you know, the disease. Usually the doctor will monitor this by moving passively your limbs, right? Either your wrist or your elbow. And so understanding that what that means the doctor is he might sometimes ask you to do something else with the other hand so that he can see the effect of doing another task will have on your rigidity and this is very important in the long run to understand how these symptoms get worse right so that we understand there's a combination tremor which is a symptom that people usually associate to parkinson but doesn't necessarily have to be there right so it's like number one the the slowness movement is has to be there and then these others can be present or not yeah there's a i mean as many as 40 percent of people with parkinson's don't have a tremor and more importantly there can be a lot of different causes for tremor so it's one of these things where the what she's talking about the slowness of movement the bradykinesia that's mm -hmm. not negotiable that has to be there but some of this mm -hmm. other stuff can be can be there or not present or not and then the tests that you might see is either the doctor asks you to put your hands out like this so that he can see if, if the how much is a trim and he's quantifying that and these tests that i'm sharing with you is basically ways for them to monitor progression of disease right? yeah. i just wish they would share that more often because then people i don't know he just he was just doing this and this so you feel that maybe there was no you know death scan or a concrete exam or an injection or something that will really you know i think he really took me seriously and so I think knowledge usually frees people from these fears that it wasn't enough. You know, kind of coming back to what you were saying before, too, where where it's like there is no definitive uh, diagnostic, there's no definitive Im imaging. And so it's like to get to this diagnosis, the doctor has to go through these processes. It's valuable to to understand where that fits. Yeah. You know? And then not only a diagnosis, just also understanding that this will be usually the focus that they will have throughout the, the disease as well. They will focus. These are the considered the, the motor issues. Um, and again, since you know I started practicing in in Parkinson, things have changed a lot. And so now, obviously, there's there's emphasis on non-motor issues as well that you hear a lot about. And so maybe the conversations are changing. Hopefully, they are, and that the doctors are talking more and doing more than just this, right? Definitely. You can see here another term that shows up, which is postural instability, which is related to balance. It is not a core issue that's supposed to be there early on. 
um, it, there can be situations, but usually it's not it's it's not supposed to be. Okay, so it's uh, guiding us on what type, what is Parkinson is a predictable disease. It has a lot of research to the point where we can get to a diagram like this, right? So then understanding what should be there and shouldn't be there also empowers you to be able to act upon problems. Yeah. So what would be another action? Right? Yeah, I mean, the next part of this, after you, you have a, hopefully a relationship with a movement disorders specialist, that neurologist with specialty fellowship training in Parkinson's, and you understand kind of what they're going for, then you go out to your community and you try to find more information. And, and a lecture like this through the Parkinson's Foundation of Western Pennsylvania is exactly where I would be starting. You, you have to find out where the helpful information is. There are a lot of... Uh, theories that maybe don't have the science to back it. There are a lot of products out there that probably shouldn't be out there and there's not much you can do about that. But what you can do, what you can take action for is to go to reliable sources, to go to a, a nonprofit resource. And again, I point in your area to the Parkinson's Foundation of Western Pennsylvania. And then the next tier might be respected medical entities. So, so if it's something associated with your doctor or a, a hospital system in your area, or uh, even one that you've heard of, like the Mayo Clinic puts out quite a bit of information. Uh, those, are, those are very good respected areas. And then you start getting into research sites and other places. But for now, um, starting with, with a, a nonprofit, starting with medical advice, and then seeing where you can find those other resources. And this is something we'd like to expand on, but not today. Really getting those tools. Yeah. Another important. important issue for sure. You, you know, uh, uh, you're on a committee with this, this person. There's a recent publication on the social prescription. And uh, um, I think it's so valuable. It's something that I think we've all intuitively known, but that social connection, being engaged with a community of your people. And some of that is through support groups and education, but it can also be an exercise program. We find that a lot of our exercise classes end up being their own little communities and that's very valuable. So you got to find them and that's again, I'm, I'm biased, but I'm pointing you towards the Parkinson's Foundation of Western Pennsylvania because again, that's the resource of reference in your area. Yeah, and I can give you a concrete examples like imagine comparing uh, individual therapy with group therapy. There is research to show that the additional benefits of doing it in group is the social cognition, right? So it's like there are additional benefits of working in groups that we did not um, think about before because we were always thinking on one on one and how how productive that would be. So I think it, it really highlights to this role of how much can we we get from each other. And even when we've had to move online uh, over the past couple of years, we, we still notice with with a group uh, that we do with the Inova Parkinson and Movement Disorder Center in in, uh, in uh, Northern Virginia, we do the classes in a group format online people still get to interact and it's 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 an attempt to try to replicate some of that social connection it's it's still something that that needs to be there otherwise mm -hmm. it's just watching a video sometimes i think yeah okay then we're thinking okay so is there any more things that we would uh, just being really objective would be important for this early stage of parkinson's disease and one thing for sure which is interesting because the the, the medication if everything goes well the medication is is considered highly effective for the symptoms of bradykinesia, for tremor, for rigidity, right? So the, the motor issues are would be expected to be well controlled, right? So one of the things that you know I I like to highlight is you know don't neglect the impact of the non-motor symptoms because this is a, a particularly sensitive uh, phase where we have a lot of situations where we can have fatigue. We can have pain, we can have anxiety, depression, um, that people might neglect in terms of saying, oh, you know, you just got a diagnosis of Parkinson, you have to accept the disease. So you, you hear a lot of that. And sometimes it's placed in that bucket and it can actually be symptoms of the disease that need to be managed with your neurologist. OK, so it's, it's important for us to uh, emphasize this. Uh, even in terms of the person feeling difficulty concentrating, it can it can be a, a factor that's actually coming from an underlying depression that's happening, right? Yeah. So it's um, it's important to too. get that yeah. knowledge so that you can act on it. And I want to also highlight that uh, the research has been growing in, in terms of 
uh, the, the stages and where what where, what type of research. And this one was actually very interesting. That was that reinforces what I just said about the first three years, how important these non-motor issues are. Um, and this was a survey that was done for about 200 patients and, and basically trying to understand what in these first years of diagnosis, what impacted more quality of life. And so you can see the fatigue and the depression are coming in strong and also sensory complaints, which would include pain and also affect skates. But just highlighting that we are aware that this is happening and because the, the medication is you know, being effective uh, for the motor issues, we also see that there are a lot of non-pharmacological interventions that are giving some response to these um, difficulties in terms of depression, pain, fatigue. And of course, you hear this often, so we won't be going into depth, but you can guess exercise, diet, sleep, right? Those are, you, you must hear that often <laughs> in terms of the prescription that everyone must be saying. But what I wanted to highlight here is the impact that it really has on these non-motor issues. And so it's, it's good to reinforce that. Yeah, yeah I, I just think that, uh, especially because sometimes the medications that may be used for some of these non-motor uh, non issues, these non-movement related issues, they don't have as much benefit in the same way that they might for other issues. And so it's, this is a great way to take some action and get some tools that you mm -hmm. can do with that without having to add to the medication load. Although sometimes those medications mm -hmm. can be very well implemented. It's just mm -hmm. the, the levodopa you're taking, it, it's just so clearly beneficial when you're taking it for the movement related stuff. Mm -hmm. And there are other strategies besides, but yeah. these the, these are the three key areas that sure. that people really reference a lot. Okay, so as we you know go through our story here, and we we jump into mid stages, which would uh, mean okay, you have everything under control, you've controlled the non motor, everything's stable. What should I do more proactively? You know, so thinking about is there something more than I can do? And here is where I would probably say, you know, there are key areas that you might want to focus on. One of the main ones that you also hear lots of talks about is, of course, gait. Now, I could spend a whole day talking about gait difficulties and strategies. Um, there are congresses only on this topic. Um, and so, obviously, if I have a key message that I want to, to pass is people need, um, need to know that uh, there, the changes are either they are progressing we know that the disease is progressing slowly so there are changes that are continuous and let me give you an example of the video what would this be the speed the the changes in gait would be the, the size and... of the step the agility <laughs> let us just take out the sound so you might see minor things like tremor when walking or a slight hesitations uh, the remember those core features and that's that's usually what what will bring on compensations if we don't act upon them which would be the slowness of the movement the person becoming slower with more rigidity and that has implications on the walking pattern so size step width and those things that we hear about now i must highlight because i know in america everyone is very active this is actually a gentleman that I have a struggle a lot to get him on exercise. So <laughs> we don't have, um, I do have other people that I have been working for, um, working with, sorry, for maybe 10, 12, 15 years, and that are uh, particularly uh, doing really well. And it's obviously it's people with a more impact on exercise, for sure. It makes a big difference. So motivation, we know, is difficult. It's not easy to just get on, you know, to, to love doing exercise ongoing. So those are one of the struggles that we have to keep people well. And, I, and I'd say that, you know, we, we know that in, uh, in the States, especially because I came from Colorado, there was an exercise culture, but it's still harder to get people motivated. And you really need to find the ways to get into an exercise routine. It has much, much uh, better outcomes over time. But yeah. Portugal particularly is not a particularly exercise yeah. destination, although you have a lot of hills. <laughs> I, I deal with, with everyone else that is not motivated with exercise. Yeah, so I have to be very creative in finding ways to keep people motivated. It's very creative. Um, and I'm happy to do that because everyone else is okay, right? They, they're doing it. Now, this might be a sensitive uh, video, but, you know, someone that's doing well. She traveled to Portugal. She struggles with this. You know, so when trying to turn... 
under uh, more stressful situations, uh, freezing occurs. So freezing will be feet getting stuck to the floor, some hesitations when crossing the door. Uh, so she came over so we could spend a week brainstorming on how to find strategies to bypass this. So again, the key message is understanding that what is uh, supposed to happen and then there's this situ this complications that might occur and both uh, you can act upon continuously ongoing to maybe to keep those changes slow to not progress as fast and when situations like this happen there are professionals that can help you right so there's there's ways to bypass these situations if we had to think about another key area that and i'd say both gait and both uh, speech tend to react less to medication and so that's why they're coming up here as key areas yeah and it's one of these kind of weird situations because i would say that most people i encounter with parkinson's upon their diagnosis, I usually, they're coming into my clinic, of course, there's a bias because they're going to refer to speech. Um, they have quiet voicing already, but it is something that seems to become more prominent later on. And while the medications might increase some factors, you might have better articulation ability, the movement related components of speech. There's a number of studies that show that intelligibility itself is not really improved. And this is uh, another issue as you, you have people who are getting diagnosed with Parkinson's and dealing with the issues that they're dealing with initially, often that perception of the speech of, of how loud they are, that might not be well, well perceived on their own. They might have a situation even where they'll continue to have you know quiet speech and maybe explain away other problems either maybe the spouse is having issues with hearings which is not uncommon or maybe they're they're explaining away with their previous profession oftentimes people people come in the office that way like i'm a very serious person i talk this way all the time and so without that um it can be difficult to to get motivated to work on it and ends up showing up a little bit later than it should in my clinic um, that that hadn't been said. I think that it's it's a problem that definitely more serious later on, but it's so common early on that I think it's almost a hallmark of the disease, and that's kind of what I was getting to with that. Although quiet speech is not the the entire enchilada, it's not everything. It's, it's certainly one of the most prominent features, but there are changes in the way people produce pitch and the word stress and the way their tongues and their teeth and their lips are moving, and then you get imprecise production of the consonants and the voice changes and the facial masking, all these play into communication. And again, it's not something where the medication is gonna be particularly beneficial, although it doesn't appear to do any real harm. Same thing I would say pretty, probably for DBS with some caveats. Okay, so, you know, as things turn more complex, I think that's how neurologists will describe, you know, because in the early stages, anyone treats Parkinson's disease, I've heard this often, uh, but, and then obviously things, symptoms start, you know, crossing over and things might become more challenging. There, I think one of the things to know is, is to really understand there's, there's a whole team wanting to help you or that can help you. Um, I think it was 21 health professionals, if I'm not mistaken, if it's in this paper, if it's in, it's in another, that are skilled to really focus on uh, a key. Now, we mentioned like gait and speech as key areas. But, you know, the symptom that probably is uh, disturbing you or, or challenging you uh, will be the one that will continue challenging you throughout the disease, right? So if it's the tremor, if it's more the slowness, and there are professionals that will focus on helping you in different uh, areas that might be your key area, right? And so that was the message here. Um, and again, we, we do realize that obviously, you know, you, you get lots of talks with, you know, understanding what each health professional does and how they can help you. What I like about this graphic, the most important thing in the person in the middle is the person living with Parkinson's and their care partners, mm -hmm. their family members. And then you start working your way out to the outer constellations. So it's not that we need them all at the same time, that you, you there's tools that you can use. They, they represent tools that you can, you can run to. Okay. Now, when we, we thought about um, this topic, and obviously this is quite challenging to be uh, speaking, you know, as honest as possible because people have access to this information at this moment. And um, I, uh, I hear often, I, I balance between wanting to know and not wanting to know. I've heard this often from people with Parkinson, you know, because it's, uh, 
it, it can it can dismotivate you to to see to see this but again we want to keep the message as possible as useful as possible so that you can it can help you manage it better okay so which means um when we think about you know later stages and things are happening understanding these motor fluctuations motor and non-motor right things that are predictable that will uh, that might that will start happening okay which is the medication is highly effective you feeling okay. you don't even feel if you if you you taking the medication you don't feel that effect and then suddenly you start feeling more maybe more tired before the next intake of the medication or if it's tremor that you're dealing with maybe the tremor is coming on more specifically in the intervals where you are taking the medication so this is what is ex expecting expected to happen and by knowing this you won't feel like there's something wrong with me and i because i also by being with people as i can i can see how much anxiety it causes not understanding what's going on why am i always tired now why oh, and I, I usually ask so when did you take your medication and oh yes i, I just took it so it's like five o'clock and the person starts feeling really tired and why i'm always feeling like this so not knowing i think will cause more anxiety than understanding that this is predictable and this will happen and your doctor will help you will try to fight so that you don't feel those intervals that's why they're always adjusting the medication so they can reduce the intervals between uh, between the intakes and there's so many more options there used to be i think the ability to optimize the medications Again, why bias towards a good movement disorder specialist? Because I think they're going to know the range of tools that are out there. But yeah, you can. Yeah. We've got better. We're better equipped than we have ever been in my career. Yeah, and, and I think people refer uh, usually focus a lot on being motor when the medication's not working, uh, and so feeling more rigid, uh, feeling uh, more slow. But the truth is, there are also non-motor fluctuations. So you might feel more anxiety and more fatigue as well these might be symptoms of what the wearing of the medication not working so well. yeah stuff like that purple dystonia <clears throat> and then because uh, a parkinson is not complex enough he decided to throw in this challenge which is unpredictable uh, situations where this on off uh, may happen and this on off means that you you're feeling well and then suddenly you're feeling bad or the opposite as well and so this making it so unpredictable, I think, is one of the hardest things to understand, uh, especially for the family, because you just saw the person really well and now he, he, he's not getting up. Ah, I wonder if he's playing, you know, so it's it's always even society and endless examples in society, how this might also not uh, be really good. Let me give you an example. So here we have a video of someone is young on onset Parkinson. He um, he's doesn't have. Oh, let's put a play first, John. Right here. Okay, hold on here. So I always find it interesting as a good example, where he's actually doing a, a test on himself. So he doesn't have a medication at this moment. So we always relate. Oh, it's the medication's not working. But no, in these unpredictable situations, he literally has no medication. And then what you see happening after he gets a cue here. Yeah, you, you can see he was really struggling in terms of walking. Just a little laggy, folks. It's coming here. Once he resets his mind, his attention, he changes his ten attention to something else, the body is able to react. Uh, and sometimes this might be confusing in terms of, oh, you know, I don't have the strength and people use a lot this word, the strength, the fatigue, but you can see if the muscles are there, they are activating, they, they are responding with this, I would call this a distractor, right? So he distracts, he changes the focus um, of his attention to the movement, to the ball and is able to unblock himself. And this is very important as a strategy in, in terms of actions um, so i have someone that if you can identify the triggers of what causes you to to become more nervous or to have more symptoms coming out it will it will help you control the frequency and the severity right so you you, you learn to read your body better so i might have someone that if he's in standing position talking with someone the rigidity might become stronger and stronger so if he, he understands that this is happening by leaning against a wall or sitting down while he's having a very 
um, engage in conversation with someone might be tricks that you can bypass these situations. Or wait, I'm doing this, this is stressing me out, let me just go for a walk. And, and this might be the solution that that person has for uh, unblocking. I'll call it unblocking, which means unblocking the body and change, shifting attention. Usually, uh, so it's like what is meaningful distraction for me might be completely different for John and for anyone else. So it's like trying to really read, uh, I would say, your, 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 your body, your reactions, so that you can see what works, what facilitates, and what makes it worse. Right? Those are key uh, strategies. Okay. So let's unfortunately add on i wish we could eliminate it all with the cure but let's yeah. let's let's go through it yes is there any questions everything good so as we add on the to the complexity and we see so dysphagia which is difficulty in swallowing we have actual deformities which is uh, changes in posture that may occur this doesn't mean that all this will happen what it means it can happen and usually if you get a full assessment with the neurologist and especially if you participate in research, then you get those full assessments where people are asking about all these symptoms and, and people will look at those questionnaires and think, am I going to have all that? No. Usually there's always um, a beginning where you say we are going to be thorough in the symptoms, but that doesn't mean you will have it. Okay, so keeping a positive note on it. But in case we do have it, we know how to act. So this is why knowledge is important. So we have things here like we have, you know, delicate subjects like the urinal, the psychosis, dementia, falls. We are all trying to understand better the disease so we don't get here. And so that we can have also tools to manage this. What can we do in these situations? If we are able to recognize quickly when a new symptom shows up, how it was in, and be able to identify what I call crisis situations. So I'll give you a good example, like maybe psychosis, right? You can have a situation where maybe you start seeing things and um, people think, oh, okay, this is part of the disease. And it's just the underlying problem can be maybe you have a dental infection and that's affecting the interactions between the medication. And that is may, maybe the cause of that hallucination that you might be seeing right so it's it's so critical for us to be able to distinguish the the symptoms in terms put them in this in this either it's the disease or it's medication related or it's complications of what of the disease or the medication so it's a lot you can see it's a lot <laughs> this is where you, you're but talking I, about it <laughs> we talk about like uh, the hallucinations a perfect example you would expect that to happen in a very mild way initially and become something that might change. And for some people, they don't experience it at all or they experience it and it stops somewhere. But to have something brand new coming up like that, that, that tells you that it's not, it's not necessarily Parkinson's related and it might be another manifestation like an infection, like you're saying, yeah. or a change in medication or something like that. Yeah, and I, I can even go to something that, um, from the experience that I was telling when, when I was listening to the complaints that people have with the neurologist, and I would have someone that would, would tell me I have pain in my feet in the morning. So the cramping and, and, and then when she's in front of the neurologist, she wouldn't even talk about pain. Right. And then I'll come and like, why didn't you talk about the pain? Oh, I didn't know I should be telling him that. Right. So it's these symptoms, this knowledge of no, but listen, that is related to probably to the medication or to the disease. And so he will have to manage that. It's specific to, for you to be able to change the medication and solve that problem and reduce it okay to that point that's your, your yeah. next slide really hits on it is figuring out those factors yeah so i think um you have access as i would say, as we reinforced earlier you have access to professionals that can help you obviously identify these things and and give you the skills to 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 be able to assess better how these things happening but i i usually like this exercise of you know whatever symptoms someone's complaining about let us study it together to understand what makes it worse and then what makes it better so that we can think about solutions. Um, and so making it worse. So you can imagine someone that's complaining about posture issues. And, you know, I feel like my posture is and I say, OK, when does this happen? Is it at the end of the day? Uh, is it when you wake up in the morning? 
how frequently does that happen? Is it when you're talking with someone in the standing position? So you can see the, the effect there of doing something else and that will affect the symptom of you become more rigid or the tremor increases because you are discussing something emotional with someone. It doesn't even have to be emotional. It's just the dual task effect of being in the standing position and, and doing something else. Um, being tired, uh, being a long time sitting on the couch and then suddenly you want to get up and then for some reason you hesitate to take that first step right it's like the legs haven't been activated yet when the medication obviously the first thing we should think about is when did i take my medication and what is the relationship of the medication to the symptom that i'm referring to i think that's usually where where i would always start so that guides us in terms of contacting the neurologist or not and then we have of course situations that will make everything worse depression anxiety right we, and these there are uh, pharmacological interventions for this as well, so it's important to be able to report that. The same thing that I just said in terms of, okay, what makes it worse? Can we find things that make it better so that we can quickly change our attention to, to something else? And um, sometimes uh, people are, are, are having bad moments and if they're very religious, they start praying and for some reason it, it, it controls. Or if they're doing something um, and they, the, it's causing them stress, they go out for a walk, as I gave an example, or just starting to uh, listen to music is such, a, is such an effective one for, for many people. But, you know, it, it, thinking about things like, am I taking my medication uh, in the right way? Am I combining it with a lot of, you know, uh, um, I don't know, coffee and tea and milk? And uh, so the way we take the medication is also something that deserves a lot of thinking. And then am I getting the right exercise, a message that you will hear often. Mm -hmm. And most of the symptoms, say, if not all, are usually worsened by our capacity to deal with situations where our attention is being challenged. So attention would be, I have to be attentive to be keeping up an upright posture. I have to be attentive to be walking and doing the right steps and not shuffling my feet. And at the same time, I have to listen to my wife or my husband talking or someone on the phone. So as you can see, these, these things that were automatic become a task. And so when you do something else, that means you are doing two tasks at once. And this is usually known to be more difficult in people with Parkinson. So we have two options. We can either take away and just do one thing at a time, which is, as you can imagine, quite impossible because life requires that we do two things at once, right? So it, this this way, this appear our resilience, our capacity to be able to deal with the interference of being upright and being able to give, uh, to talk with somebody is, uh, it's a new type of training that people keep talking about now, which is dual task training. And it's important because of this, it will make, it usually interferes with the symptoms. Okay, so being mindful in terms of time, I think, yes, so we have one last one so yeah <laughs> it's just one of these things where again she mentioned the, the the woman having the issue with pain and not reporting it things that are showing up if you can get it on your doctor's radar early um on the one hand it allows uh, them and the other professionals to kind of monitor how frequently it's occurring whether it's getting worse so that kind of helps us with progression but also it's much easier to address these kind of problems early on it's much easier to maintain function than it is to restore function and i put i put speech in that area but you know another one that, that you, you see much later on dysphagia the swallowing issue mm -hmm. if you're having some issues with pills early on good talk to the doctor about it because uh, getting to a speech therapist early on we can do a lot with that it'll be much harder later on it's not impossible but it's do you change the oil in your car or do you wait till you burn you bend the valves you know it's like that kind of thing so and i, and I think there, there might be symptoms that are uh, considered light and so you might oh it's not it's not an issue like imagine that one of the hallucinations maybe visions that we see is flowers oh, that doesn't really disturb it's yeah. not discomfort it doesn't provoke anxiety so when i get to the neurologist i'll let him know and that's what six months after three months after um is it relevant it I know it's not easy for people to just access the neurology. It mm -hmm. should be. It should be because believe me, that is actually the secret I, that I have from my experience is being able to WhatsApp the neurologist and say, this is happening and identifying problems immediately and acting upon them. 
but because that's not possible, let us give knowledge to people so they can act upon it. When it, when does it really make sense to really knock at the door? Yeah, I mean, and it, get, and it, get something done in the states. I mean, it, it's it's very easy to make a call to the nurse who are often those advanced practice providers are often your front line. I remember we did a session with uh, with the Innova Parkinson Movement Disorder Center and we talked about using my chart, which is a very common platform for just sending messages. And so I think those two two ways, making a, a call to the, the office and having the nurse put it on the radar, or if it's better if you go right to my chart. Um, and those are good ways to get that across so you're not waiting until um, six months or something. I see I see something coming in on the chat. I just want to make sure we, we don't miss this here. Um, yes. Okay. Darn it. I Oops. hit the wrong one here, guys. Yep. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, when do you need to see another doctor uh, for something like depression? It might be not a. I don't know why this mm -hmm. is not moving down here, but I can't get it faster. There we go, guys. Um, and the so issue. We, we're just reading a question, and yeah. the question is when. Do you know you need to see another doctor for, like for something? Opinion? No, to, for something like depression. I, I don't know why this, this screen froze on me. So it's it, open it here. yeah, and an issue is that I think it's a good good question to ask the doctor because if there's a specific need, again, a neurologist has quite a bit of, uh, of psychology training and background, and those particular medications can often be very efficacious. So that might be a good start with your neurologist, but often they might have someone. This is. Again, I'm going to keep beating on the drum. Seeing a movement disorder specialist is a good start because they'll kind of know when it's time to to bring it to someone else in their in their area. You know, like a, somebody has a nice deep bench, a nice center of excellence, or just a nice uh, clinic that has a range of doctors, has often a psychiatrist on staff, and if not a psychiatrist, then a doctor that's more attuned to that. And so that's why it's nice to have uh, a relationship with a doctor that maybe has a little deeper bench. And I think a neurologist will identify if that is regard the depression can be regarded to the the dopamine, right? And so if he changes your um, your medication for Parkinson, that means maybe maybe that's something that's controlled, right? And it can obviously also be a reactive to the diagnosis itself. So it's I would definitely say start always with him. Sometimes I have people going from different doctors for different things and and you kind of get lost in that process. And I always say, you know, go back to your neurologist, especially if you have a good relationship with him, he will guide you on what is needed for the rest. Yeah, you want to have a long-term relationship, not not just with the yeah. doctor, but also with your rehab team. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple more questions coming in here. We're about to do maybe, our summary, so maybe we'll, we'll go Yeah, ahead. maybe we'll just, you know, finish up with the, the actions and then we'll take this this PowerPoint so we can we can engage and talk yes, with you Yes, yeah, and there's a couple of good questions that we'll, we won't no, skip them. Okay. Uh, so the idea was uh, was there. Okay. So if we have, you know, in this case, one hour with people with Parkinson, what would be important to share? And so it's actually it comes down to uh, to ten ten things that we we suggest for you. So number one, if you recall, it's really getting to know what to expect from a neurologist so that you can understand if you are um, feeling safe with him. I would say the word safe that he's he's you know diving deep into into your diagnosis and, and keeping you well. You want to make sure that you find helpful information. You want to go to trusted resources. And again, I'd start with, with the Parkinson's Foundation of Western Pennsylvania or somebody affiliated with your physician's office if they have uh, materials that they're putting out. That's, that's important. Don't, don't, go, don't fall yeah. for the scams. There's a bunch of people out there selling stuff. It's terrible. Yeah. Then reinforcing that uh, there's a tendency for people to maybe isolate because you know you just don't don't want to deal with that. Pe talking with others is fatiguing. <laughs> people don't value that. <laughs> but um, but it's really you know really putting yourself out there and making yourself engage is really important to keep uh, your physical and your mental health. Okay? I think we've all found that over over the past yeah. couple of years. COVID taught us that, right? And, <laughs> Don't neglect the impact of the non-motor symptoms because uh, I think again doctors are becoming much more aware of it. But uh, it's something that you can be bringing up in those visits, and also looking beyond medications, looking to diet and sleep and exercise as ways to manage that, a ways mm -hmm. to take action for that. Yeah. So even if a doctor doesn't uh, talk about a certain topic, as you could see the complexity of Parkinson's disease always discuss it anyway you know bring it up it's uh, they they will be happy to answer that they should be happy to answer it especially because it shows how much you are already learning about it as well right so you're proactive 
And number five, obviously understanding that there are key areas that are being targeted by a lot of research and that a lot of um, strategies might be that, you know, early on that you learn that can really change everything. So then we have obviously uh, getting to know, you know, the, the health professional so that you don't feel overwhelmed with this type of knowledge. It's like, how am I going to know if it's from the disease, if it's from the medication? There's prof the professionals exist for that, right? And then obviously, you know, identifying uh, what triggers, uh, you know, the, the best way to manage symptoms is to understand what makes it worse, what makes it better, and that will help guide you on solutions. It also helps when you go to the doctor with that information, armed with that information, even yeah. just a couple of days before you go to the doctor, if you can just get a little mm -hmm. bit of a feel for when you're feeling better and worse, it helps them yeah. help you. Okay, and then number eight, we, you know, recognizing and managing the crisis situations quickly and effectively. So identifying that, wait a minute, I woke up today and I'm having so much difficulty walking. This is not supposed to be like this. Walking is challenged continuously, but you don't wake up one day and you're not able to walk. Something is happening, so you should really act upon it and, and talk with your doctor. Yeah, contact the office. Yeah, this is along that same line. Yeah. Something shows you know, up. Don't don't wait till your next six yeah, months. And I highlight out. here the family and obviously uh, the the partners that are with you. They because you, we have difficulties perceiving the symptoms, it is very important to include the family in this and helping you. You know what are we going to register? What are we going to tell the doctor? I think it's important to have different eyes looking at the same problem. And then of course number ten and the most important one is to take action. <laughs> so hopefully what we transmitted today will help guide you in a, in a better journey. And that was our messages for for you. Too. Yeah, you can't you can't stop what's coming per se, but you can certainly define how that appears. You can you can you can take action now that will pay off in, well into the future. And as well as things change faster than I've ever thought they would change, um, mm -hmm. we might get to better treatments and ultimately a cure. That's what we're all hoping for. Yeah. So, yeah okay. Pull this up here. So. Let there were two go. questions in there, so I'm going to make sure we don't miss them, but it also if anyone can unmute or put a hand up there, we can talk. Mm -hmm. the, the first one was about training for dual task, and it's so funny because I think the way we first met the folks at the Parkinson's Foundation of Western Pennsylvania is we came in, we trained some of the clinicians that were there. We actually did two trainings. I, I'm, I'm hopeful we'll, we'll be able to come in. COVID made a bit of a mess of things for a while, but we might be able to come in and do that again. Um, we are doing classes online. Uh, again, that may be something that may be coming in your way. We also do them with the ANOVA Parkinson and Movement Disorder Center online dual task exercise. That's kind of what mm -hmm. I'm a speech therapist. She's a physical therapist. We really spend a lot of energy on that. And John, if I could just weigh in right there. Sure. Um, we definitely want you to come back and do the train the trainer thing in yeah. 2023. But, I, you know, I'd love to incorporate some dual task training sessions into our programming with you because our folks have seen it and they've seen the benefit. Um, so let's, let's do it. Harry, you don't have to go on the internet. You can come to us. Especially because you have a, a really great set of clinicians and we've met a lot of them in person and we've seen them working in action. So I think uh, it'd be great to do that training and they can take the ball and run. They've been really, they've been really, Ian, Ian's been such a great over the years for us but many other clinicians sorry to mm -hmm. sorry to name one and not the others i'm sorry guys but it's the person i talked to the most um uh, and it someone says what recommendations do you have for a patient that doesn't want to learn more and refuses to do the exercise and i'll have to say that <laughs> not learning more but portugal that that's where the creativity comes in there because i that think is, i would say 80 percent or 90 percent well 95 percent yeah of usually, you know, people, uh, I usually say that in Portugal, you know, we work a lot, we have lots of hours. So this, this thing of exercising is, is mm, what? <laughs> I'm going to exercise um, my coffee here. So hand. being able to, to, first of all, I would probably try to understand better the situation in terms of, are we talking about a situation where we might having underlying apathy, uh, depression? Is there something going on that might be compromising the motivation? Um, again, following like, is there something that might be justifying this situation, given that uh, that everyone is obviously always speaking, you, know, you have access to always having motivation next to you, either the care partner or or your friends always telling you how to do exercise, right? And then I mean, in terms of um, 
strategies hmm. again knowing the person the more i know the person the more creative i can be in trying to find something because when you compare to just sitting on the couch then you say anything is good i don't agree when the person is already motivated and doing exercise i don't think we should just go to anything is good any type of exercise because there's a lot of research that helps us guide you better right but when we are dealing with someone that is you struggling with getting motivated then there it's urgent that any movement that the person likes to do how can i bring that how can i enhance that so if it's either one strategy that usually works is music because most people like music and dancing um, i would say specific dancing that the person really likes um, uh, sorry music that the person really likes even if you're not a dancer you know you hear rock and roll and you and you just feel like jumping up right <laughs> so I, i'll use strategies like that it really depending on imagine the person like to play soccer uh, i usually often get that even in severe situations the person will always try to go get something that they did before and motivate them through there. Um, if the person is having difficulty walking, I wouldn't say go out for a walk because that's me being irrealistic about what the person can do. Uh, so I can say that things like sitting and standing 10, 12 times will make a big difference at the end of the month if you do that every single day. Yeah. Uh, so that's a simple enough. I usually call it the exercise of shame which is if you don't do that, you're the worst person ever, right? So, I mean, you have to create this type of relationship to be able to create exercises, but yeah. I know that maybe I won't be specific in to the answer, but it really depends on the type of person. Yeah. The I, environment. I, I think you, you, the help he has as well. And again, this is where I think getting ensconced in a little bit more education over time. I mean, I think different lectures will have more, more, theories for this, more opportunities. I, I think back to that. I watched something over the weekend called Stutz, which is about a, a, a guy living with Parkinson's. It wasn't about him, but he talked about right in the middle of having a problem and he's doing a little exercise. That people find their ways in there. You got to find a way to to be creative mm -hmm. with them. Yeah. But, but also think, start with the doctor. We make sure it's not apathy or something that we could be trying to address as well. Yeah. And I think if the person explicitly, I don't want to learn anymore, which means probably there's a red flag for me when I read this is maybe we're talking too much sometimes mm -hmm. as 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 partners as, as a therapist and you know just engaging with the person and just walking and talking and talking about something that the person is interested in is a form of exercise right it's getting that person up getting that person walking and doing something so it, i'd probably use those try to understand why the person is saying no yeah maybe some peers as well and i'm sure again the, yeah. the foundation probably has some resources there where they can talk with others uh, living with Parkinson's. Maybe that gives them a different perspective. I, I know we're cutting tight, close on the time here, guys. If, if people have additional questions, we'll be happy to, to help yeah. and answer them. But we know that we won't normally push it this close. We wanted to give a nice big overview of kind of where things mm -hmm. we will do lectures on these different topics and, and some other ones as well. I do have a question for you. Oh, OK. Was it more or less useful? Yes or no? Uh oh. <laughs> Uh, Doreen, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, folks. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank I want to do you. a shout out to Casey as well, because, you know, Josepha, Josepha to your point, um, there are exercises that are specifically good for PD, but, you know, any exercise that you do is better than nothing. And so Casey is being very creative and coming up with adaptive programming and things that, you know, kayaking, wall climbing, things that, you know, can be accomplished by people with PD that safely, that may be different than doing a delay the disease class or something that can become repetitive. So we're trying to get creative and get people out there. So stay tuned. Yes, and let us and know. Let us know if you have other ideas. And I was just going to add on to that, which is sometimes you change the programs, right? So it's like you might get doing boxing for a while and you get bored and then you want to change the stimulus as well. So changing a variety, I think, is also important. So it's good you have all those programs yeah, going. Get back on the website and find something new, find a new yeah. challenge. Go, go to the Parkinson's Foundation yes, yeah. exercise listings and see what else is out there and try something different. Yeah. All right, folks. So hopefully everyone is okay. And um it will be useful okay yeah so it's a tough question to answer but <laughs> thank you <laughs>